my name is Sansi Pitkanen and I'm the chairman of the board of Situ this year. And I have a few words to say before we start. So, welcome to this webinar organized by Psytu, the Finnish Association for Psychedelic Research. You can post your questions for the speaker in Zoom's Q&A section, and when the host of the event chooses your question, we'll give permission for you to open your microphone. After that, you can ask your question out loud. And if you don't want to ask the question yourself, you can indicate this at the end of your written question, and your question will be then read by the host, and that is me. You can also select the option to submit your question anonymously, of course. And in the Q&A section, you also have the ability to upvote on questions asked by other attendees. And it is a good to remind you that the event will be recorded for later publication on our YouTube channel. And our topic today is psychoanalytic perspectives on psychedelics, and our speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Goss. And Dr. Goss is a psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, researcher, and teacher with specializations in psychoanalytic therapy and psychedelic therapy. He's on the faculty of the NYU postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, and is a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at NYU School of Medicine. So please welcome Dr. Goss, and I will give him now the opportunity to give his presentation. Thank you. So hopefully all of you are seeing beautiful clouds floating across the sky. Is that working and uh, in shape, looking good? Yes. Okay. So this is um, psychoanalytic perspectives on psychedelic therapy with a special emphasis on a clinical presentation. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, the Helsinki uh, Psychedelic Society, I mean, the uh, Finnish Psychedelic Society and uh, Henry for inviting me. And also I wanna thank Yuso and Ansi for the uh, support and help in today's presentation. As mentioned, I'm a lead trainer with Fluence and I'm also on the faculty at NYU postdoctoral program uh, in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis as well as part of NYU School of Medicine. These are my disclosures. I've done research with Hefter and USONA and I'm a consultant with each of the uh, institutions listed there. Thank you so much for having me. And it's really a pleasure to be here talking about psychedelics, psychoanalysis, and in particular presenting this clinical case that was part of the NYU randomized clinical trial uh, using psilocybin assisted therapy for cancer related existential distress. One of the uh, <clears throat> uh, processes that I have become uh, introduced to and that I'm gonna continue here is a land acknowledgement. I, I, I've never heard of such a thing before becoming involved in uh, psychedelic research, but I am coming to you from Midtown Manhattan, which is right about here. And the original inhabitants of this island were the Ladape Indians, the original uh, inhabitants of um, Manhattan. And this is a way to acknowledge and respect the indigenous people as the traditional stewards of this land. They were, uh, Lenape were one of the many nations that were under the larger term, the Algonquins. And scientists think that the uh, ancestors of the Lenape Indians migrated uh, here about 15,000 years ago. And they gradually spread throughout North and South America. Um, and have distributed themselves oops, uh, uh, across the United States, uh, having been forced to migrate first to New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and now inhabit uh, some enforced reservations and some not of uh, many parts of the Midwest. There's a, the outline for today's talk. There are four parts. First, I want to locate psychedelic therapy and psychoanalytic psychedelic therapy among the diversity of co contexts in which psychedelic use occurs. Then I'm going to give a list of the phenomenology 
of psychedelic experience designed to be understood by psychoanalysts. This is part of a presentation that I gave to several groups of psychoanalysts, trying to introduce them to what the diversity of experience that really is part of a, a, a psychedelic experience. Then I'm going to describe the NYU cancer-related study that I was uh, part of. And then last, I'm going to do this clinical case presentation. Locating psychedelic therapy among the diversity of psychedelic contents, a context. What I'm going to do today is present how we use psychedelic assisted therapy in a very specific context, randomized clinical trial. But there are other places in which, uh, as I'm sure all of you know, psychedelics can be used responsibly and safely and uh, beautifully. One is responsible recreational use. We have so much interest in healing untreatable or poorly treatable illnesses that in some ways we don't even speak that much about fun, having pleasure, having a good time, enjoying yourself and having sociability facilitated by psychedelics. Also, many people use psychedelics for personal growth, either with a sitter or alone or in a community. Psychedelics are certainly uh, used in rave settings or tribal dance settings. This is a photograph of a uh, salvia uh, ceremony that occurred in Goa, India. We have contemporary syncretic neo-shamanic settings, that is uh, settings that have been uh, developed as a combination of many, many different cultural factors taken from indigenous practices. Here we see uh, three different ayahuasca circles that are not traditional uh, shamanic circles, but they have many, many elements of them, as well as a broad variety of eclectic influences uh, that, that create a unique blend of experiences. Again, not a randomized clinical trial, we have true indigenous shamanic settings. On the left, we have a Shipibo curandera, uh, and at the bottom, a curandero uh, doing souffle with a, uh, a patient or somebody in his study. And at the top, we have uh, Carlos Tanner, who I'm proud to consider a friend with whom I studied in uh, uh, South America for a number of weeks as part of uh, a sh introductory shamanic training, which I, I did not undertake. I did not become uh, an ayahuasca shaman, uh, although I took a little bit of the, I did the introductory uh, weeks and realized that that particular path was not for me. But I had a really great experience there, and it really shaped the way that I teach and <clears throat> do psychedelic therapy in my milieu, which is randomized clinical trials as well as uh, ketamine. Uh, there are syncretic religious settings, the uh, Santo Daime, the UDV, and the Native American Church. On the left, we have the UDV wearing white with green sashes, drinking, and below, I think, is I think is a UDV with the all green outfits. On the right, the Native American Church, and last in this list, we have the randomized clinical trial of psilocybin-assisted therapy. So it looks really quite different. Uh, than all of the other images, but this is the one in which I particularly have had the most experience a as a psychedelic therapist. And in fact, it's the only setting in which I have regularly practiced psychedelic therapy with other people. That's because it is the only place where it is legal and above ground <clears throat> in the United States. And these are just some more images. This is the NYU uh, study room. This is the outer doors to the uh, um, research center in which we conducted our NY, the NYU study. This is the way that a manual looks. It's all in a book with lots of instructions. This is data because uh, this is just like a graphic representation of data because this is the true product of clinical research. Clinical research exists to produce a certain kind of data and it's structured in a way that best produces the most useful and reliable and powerful data. Uh, this is the NYU, I mean, this is the uh, uh, Hopkins setting. I believe this is Bill Richards and Mary Cosabano, two luminaries in our field. And this is the pill. It is not a mushroom. It is a synthetic product that comes out of a 
a laboratory. So those are the images for that. Now, each of the uh, dis the um, uh, situations or contexts for psychedelic experience, they can be divided into three different levels of responsibility. One, self-responsibility, where the individual is alone and the individual is responsible for himself, herself, or their self. And in this, they need to maintain vigilance for their own safety and well-being. The second is a peer care or a peer responsibility model, such as a dance space, group tripping, a lay guide, a sitter, friend, watching you, a spouse, somebody who is there for you. So you don't have to have full responsibility for yourself, but that person is a peer. And the third is professional responsibility. And I'm going to talk a little bit about professional responsibility because I think differentiating the peer care and professional level of care is very important. Uh, there are some who seek to erase some of this distinction and reduce or lessen the sense of professionalism that many uh, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists bring. But um, I am not comfortable with that. I think it's really important to distinguish between person-to-person -person peer care and a professional responsibility. And in order to do so, I'm going to share just a little bit of information from this book, Witch Doctors and Psychiatrists by E. Fuller Torrey. In this book, uh, Dr. Torrey describes um, the experience of healing in a community by a professional, whether that's a shaman or a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist. First, a person suffers or a community marks that person as suffering from a condition, some kind of malady. Next, that person seeks help from a special, well-trained, community-sanctioned leader. So it's very important that the uh, community has sanctioned the healer and that the community has ties to the healer in which responsibility for the work that he or she does is held by the community. So how somebody becomes a healer and how you maintain your reputation as a healer are community-based. It is not just a matter of saying, oh, I'm a healer because I said so. Uh, being a, uh, a healer in a community is something that happens um, as a result of a consensus by the community. And there are many shamans who won't say, I am a shaman, but who the community says, you are a shaman, you are a healer. Okay, so the next step, that suffering is understood or narrated in a, shame, in a shared way between the sufferer and the healer. Now, a South American shaman and the person suffering and a North American psychoanalyst and the person suffering may understand the, the problem and the treatment of the problem in different ways, in different languages. But the most important thing is that they share an understanding and that they have a, an, a, a shared idea of what the journey from suffering, from the malady to healing or getting better is going to uh, take place. So what is my problem? How is it defined? How did I come to have this problem? And how do I escape? So the shaman should have a very clear idea in his or her or their own mind what this is and recommend a treatment. So treatment happens and the healer is in charge of helping keep the treatment on track. So these blue are the core parts of the parallels for me uh, between a shaman and a professional uh, healer in uh, Western society. So number five, Usually money or goods changes hands. And second, the sufferer is changed, hopefully for the better. The culture understands the nature of that change and embraces the healed person in his new condition. So that's the completion of the community validation of the work that the healer has done. So these are some things that shamans and doctors share. They both have extensive training and apprenticeship that takes years, not days and not weeks. We're currently in the middle of a practically a training frenzy all around the world to bring people into being psychedelic therapists relatively quickly. And I just want to comment that to become a doctor, to become an analyst, to become a shaman takes years. 
and an individual has experience treating people with that particular problem using that treatment. In this, I want to communicate that just having done a lot of psychedelics doesn't make you a psychedelic therapist or a psychedelic healer. It makes you a person who's really experienced <laughs> with psychedelics and that you may have natural healing abilities, but simply experience with psychedelics doesn't make you a therapist. The shaman and the doctor are responsible to select which patients come for treatment and are given the treatment. And we have this turned around too. In certain ways, uh, the patients come saying, I want the treatment. And uh, some uh, healers will go, why, yes, of course, I will give that to you rather than um, we'll decide together what the treatment will be. So you have to select a treatment. You have to prepare the patient for it. You have to run the treatment. You have to identify cor and correct problems that arise during the treatment. Uh, in uh, indigenous cultures, the shaman is responsible to maintain the quality, the security, the safety of the medicine. Although in uh, uh, the West, we have uh, uh, you know, brought another specialty named pharmacy and pharmacology and pharmacists to, to do this part of it. Uh, the doctoring part and the pharmacology part have been separated into two institutions, but they're both highly regulated and both involve a great deal of training and maintaining your skill and ability and safety uh, in order to continue to work in the community in that way. Then the person is responsible for long-term planning, recommending more treatment or not, uh, or adding other types of treatment that may be necessary and may not even be imagined by the patient and learning from experience from each patient in order to treat the next person more skillfully. Okay, thank you. Next, psychedelic phenomenology for psychoanalysts. Uh, you know, the, oh, okay. These, um, the, the list that I'm going to share with you is taken largely from these two papers. The first, a qualitative study of the NYU cancer related anxiety. Uh, study that was conducted by uh, my good friends uh, Alex Belser, Gabby Egan Liebes, and Cody Swift. And uh, although a lot of other people's names are on here because we did the entire study, these three are the are the really the uh, uh, core practitioners and researchers that did the study. And there's another one too called Cancer at the Dinner Table, which is about the, uh, it's, a, it's the same study, but they divided it into two papers. This one about patient experiences, the other about uh, uh, how cancer uh, became, you know, figured into the psychedelic experience. And the other is a paper that I cannot recommend too highly. This is a foundational paper written by another person whom I consider privileged to uh, call a friend, Larry Fishman. And if you don't know this paper, I recommend it very highly. Seeing Without the Self, Discovering New Meaning with Psychedelic Assisted Psychotherapy. This was published in Neuropsychoanalysis. And uh, I can't imagine a better setting for this paper to come forward. This is really a neuropsychoanalytic exploration of psychedelic phenomenology. So we're taught that it's wrong to read a list during a PowerPoint presentation, but I'm gonna go ahead and do that anyway. Each one of these points can be a, you know, could be an entire talk, could be a book really. But what I, what I hoped to do in pulling this list together is in teaching to psychoanalysts what psychedelic experience is that relates to psychotherapy right? That relates to psychotherapy and psychoanalytic process, not necessarily visionary uh, spiritual work or scientific problem solving work or dancing at a rave, but the psychedelic experiences that are most relevant to the psychotherapeutic process include, first, the emergence of intensely emotional memories, fantasies, imagery, including warded off mental context. So of course, this means the unconscious or the subconscious and the whole question of how we maintain things in our unconscious or subconscious and how they get brought forward in uncanny moments in psychoanalytic treatment and in psychedelic experience, I think it's such a fascinating area. But uh, I wanted to communicate to psychoanalysts that 
psychedelics open up access to unconscious mental contents. Psychedelics increase interoceptive perception of the interior of the body. Psychedelics uh, often evoke a mystical state or a sense of oceanic boundlessness, including the experience of awe and sacredness. Psychedelics often result in a deepening emotional intensity in transference or the unconscious processes that get activated in relationship to the therapist himself or herself. Psychedelics can evoke a shift from secondary process into primary process, which is a very central idea in um, psychoanalysis. And it, it isn't used very much in those, those terms are not used very much in uh, psychedelic circles, but uh, what they describe certainly is. And another way to see this is that there was less sharp differentiating differentiation of ideas and images and in states of conscious uh, cognition. So there may be symbolic, metaphoric communication, synesthesia, uh, unless you know one sense not being as distinguished from another, and important differentiations like before and after, inner and outer, uh, exterior and interior of the body, self and others. All of these differentiations that we make in secondary process can soften. And this, of course, is as it should be <laughs> of extreme interest to psychoanalysts, who I've discovered sometimes have a certain amount of fear and uh, trepidation about psychedelics. So there's an increase in unusual associative patterns. I think one of the most fascinating things about psychedelics is that they reduce our usual familiar quotidian uh, thought patterns and unusual associative patterns are increased. And in psychoanalysis, this is called free association. Uh, next, the appearance of personal insights, but not insights of uh, just you know, the, the words of them or the language of them, but there is a deep affective resonance and truth to the insight as it occurs, which is what gives it its, its power. It is the affective resonance that makes something move from informational to transformational. Um, next, the experience of a highly charged life review, that is, as if you're sitting before St. Peter and your life is being reviewed and only you are reviewing your life in the psychedelic experience, looking at what you've done, what you didn't do, how your life is acquiring meaning here at the, uh, the, the peak in which you are um, engaging in the overview of what your life has meant and what that might mean for the future. Next, common is the emergence of a complex, meaningful origin story. Uh, usually in Western psychology, we think of an origin story beginning with our birth and how we were brought up by our parents, or within psychoanalytic language, there often is an interest in intergenerational transmission of trauma or intergenerational transmission of uh, narratives. So we may go back a couple of generations uh, and occasionally people think about the origin of the universe, the origin of the planet, uh, the origin of life itself. Uh, and this tends to be more central in indigenous cultures uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the origin story <clears throat> goes way back, goes farther back. Next, feelings of connection and connectedness and a decrease in alienation and sense of aloneness. Also a heightened salience that is just the feeling, the feeling that things have meaning, that things are meaningful, and that their meaning is yet to be understood, as opposed to thinking, okay, that's an apple, I know what it is, I've seen it before, that's an apple, it's just like all other apples, uh, maybe it's crisp, or maybe it's mushy, but I know what it, is, what it is, and Hayden Salen says, oh, apples, apple computers, Johnny Appleseed, apple cider, apple of my eye, there's so many different ways that the idea can have you know, resonances and associations and that these feel very, very important. And next and last, increased self-awareness. Uh, and something that I think is so interesting that there are uh, usually, if the dosage is right, is a memory of the experience, an intact sensorium. One of the more fascinating philosophical um, truths is that I've had, you know, a number of patients and a number of 
participants, if you could call them in a, in a study, say, I cease to exist. I was no longer there as David or Susan or, you know, uh, Kanisha. I cease to exist. I wasn't there. And yet, who was there that remembers that happening? Who was there that was present for that, experienced it, and is able a couple of hours later to recall and recount that experience and talk about how the self that was there has been changed as a result of that. Okay, so the list of phenomena that I've, that I've curated here reflect those that are most likely to occur or at least most likely to be relevant for psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy content context. So these phenomena might differ in a religious setting that involves psychedelics or in a setting that focuses on creativity or problem solving. So next, I would like to move on to talk about the description of the study of, that the patient was in that I'm going to present. So this is the study room. These are my colleagues uh, that did the study. This is the paper that we published. And you notice that it started out as a randomized clinical trial on cancer-related existential distress. But by the time it became a paper, it stowed, the story was of a rapid and sustained symptom reduction following psilocybin treatment for anxiety and depression. So existential distress became uh, anxiety and depression symptoms in patients. And that's because this is what we felt would be the most solid kind of argument to make for the efficacy of these medications, all directed towards their being rescheduled and available for prescribing. The problem here is that existential distress is not a DSM-5 diagnosis. And so having a, 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 a medicine experience that treats something that's not a recognized diagnosis is a problem. It has to be related to. And here we don't have a diagnosis, but we have a life-threatening cancer causing anxiety and depression. And you know, to this end, the uh, syndrome demoralization syndrome has become recognized as a DSM-5 diagnosis. And so now we are looking at using psilocybin treatment to treat uh, demoralization syndrome. Okay, so this, this uh, slide, I'm sure it looks very complicated, and it is, but I hope that I will in one slide be able to describe to you the, the, what happened for people in the study. So they were admitted here. There were four to six weeks before they met the therapist where they were given consent, they were admitted to the study, their labs were done, medications were tapered, and they were prepared to actually um, enter the treatment part of the study. So this is pre-preparatory, okay? This study was a double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study, which means there were two dosing sessions. Everyone received both niacin and psilocybin at different times. They didn't know, and the therapist didn't know whether they were receiving niacin or, or uh, psilocybin here. And in this study, they received the opposite condition. So everybody got one dose of psilocybin, which isn't always the case. Some studies have a placebo control and half of the people roughly don't get psilocybin at all. They get placebo. Um, <clears throat> so there were four weeks for preparatory sessions with the therapists, three preparatory sessions, during this initial four weeks. This arrow actually should go out right here. Then a dosing session, either niacin or psilocybin, then seven weeks for integration. And we call this integration because whether the person received niacin or psilocybin, we treated it as if they had had a profound transformative experience because that's part of the, the study. You work with each session as if neither you nor the patient no, even if you feel like you know, you work with it, uh, giving all of the kind of credence that it was a profound experience, no matter whether they received niacin or, or not that it was profound, but that uh, we treat it as if it's a meaningful experience and do integration of whatever it is that happened here. So then there's a seven week period. Then there's the second dosing session, which I've said, as I said, is a inversion of this. And then there are four more weeks with three integration sessions. 
And after that, the therapist portion of the study ends, and there were four months of monitoring, and then they left the study. And um, one of my colleagues has followed all the people that were in the study that lived uh, you know, for long enough, up to four years after the completion of the study, and that was her PhD dissertation, working with the people that were in the study, looking at them over, over the long, uh, long term. Now, many people think of psilocybin-assisted therapy as this, that it is just what you do during the day. And that is really not the case. In fact, um, so much of what happens here in the preparatory and integration session contributes to what happens here, just as what happens here affects what happens in the, in the talk therapy sessions. But psilocybin-assisted therapy, the emphasis is on the therapy, and the psilocybin is there to assist the therapy, which is not the same model as many people who take high dose psychedelic experiences in a non therapeutic context. But that's a different talk. So now we're back to this, and I'm not sure that there's anything more that I want to communicate there. This is the training manual that I wrote. Uh, the last iteration of it was in 2008. And of course, you don't have training manuals for psychedelic therapists anywhere except in uh, clinical research. Although uh, as um, community-based psychedelic experiences become available, we are starting to have ways of training therapists or training facilitators to do uh, psychedelic work with uh, individuals who come forward, like in Oregon and in Colorado. But again, that's a different talk than this. So the therapy that we used included existential therapy, a la Viktor Frankl, palliative care therapy, psychodynamic therapy. There were three manualized therapies that we used. And so all of these came together in kind of a, kind of a um, not very well, you know, uh, uh, particularized uh, way. We just, Put, put all these together and came up with what we thought would be the best way to work with patients. We studied all of these and each of us and brought to our patients or our participants, you know, what we thought would be best. And we had a structure for each session, but I'm not sure that everybody followed it super carefully. The first preparatory session, the instruction was to find out about the life narrative, emphasizing how meaning is made for that person to learn about their cancer narrative not their markers or what their, who their cancer doctor is or what chemo they're taking, but what their story is. We explored their family and relationships. We explored their values and how they found hope and strength in the world and opened up, tried to open up fears and losses, disappointments and dreams. We used this structured interview um, described or, or invented by Virginia Lee in working with people who had cancer from uh, a nursing point of view. And the goal was to help the participant and the therapist develop rapport and a therapeutic alliance. This is from uh, Dr. Lee's paper. You make a line, you put the date of birth, and death here, but cancer in the middle. So first, acknowledging the present. Second, contemplating the past. What was meaningful? What gave life importance and value? What disappointments happened here? What proud events happened here? And then finally, the future after cancer. So the present, past, and the future. And this is um, one of the uh, life review exercises that we did in the study. Uh, here's birth, here's the cancer diagnosis, here is now, and here is that particular individual's death. I'm gonna give you a close-up. Uh, born, did well in school, he was mean to his brother. He changed schools, he was in gymnastics. He didn't get into a good college. He had, he's made friends. Here he had trouble making, he had trouble making, he didn't make friends. Then he started to make friends. This is lacrosse, shy around girls. So these were the, uh, the aspects of life that this particular person said were important to him. And what was great about this is in one session, we reviewed the patient's life, we developed a rapport with them, and we helped them learn about their own values and prepared to use the, those, that information about the values and what was important to them in life in their, in their journey. 
So uh, I'm going to skip the dosing sessions because I have a feeling that the audience here knows what dosing sessions are like. The integration sessions, we try to make meaning and incorporate that meaning into their perspective on themselves and the world. And there we go. Okay, so now we're moving on to the, to the main part of the talk for today, this clinical case presentation, a young man's relationship with his cancer body. I'll start with the clinical history. The patient's name is Robert. When Robert came to our study, he was 22 years old. He was suffering from panic attacks, severe daily anxiety, and a gravely distorted body image. The symptoms had been plaguing him since his recovery from a life-threatening acute T-cell leukemia that occurred to him when he was age 17 in his senior year of high school. This was fully five years prior to his coming to the NYU study for existential distress. When, when Robert presented, he was very healthy looking. Uh, he'd been released from treatment uh, as cancer free for a full two years. He was bright and articulate. He spoke in a very matter of fact way and he was rather uh, effectively constricted, but with his words, he was very expressive of what was going on for him. He had panic attacks. He felt that his body was a traumatized, damaged body. His body image was severely distorted. He felt like his body was cadaverous, like he was still as thin and vulnerable and frail as he was at the worst of his illness. And he was preoccupied with death. Although he had returned to eating food and athletics and he had a girlfriend and he was sexually active. All of these uh, realities of life did not change his internal experience of himself as uh, preoccupied with death, cadaverous, and really on the, on the brink of death and preoccupied with death. So these symptoms lasted long after his cancer treatment was completed and he had been declared uh, fully healthy and was released from oncology. When Robert came to our study, he was in the process of completing his undergraduate degree. He was majoring in anthropology. He had a girlfriend and he was working on applications to graduate school. Some of the family uh, developmental history. Robert grew up in a large religious family that was very deeply observant of Christianity within their congregational Methodist church. The family engaged in regular home prayer and weekly Bible study. These were a central part of the family life and were deeply meaningful uh, and welcome to, to Robert. He was homeschooled by his mother up to the eighth grade. He grew up with a profoundly deep faith in God and Christ and in religion and the power of prayer. He had had a personal relationship with Christ and this faith was central to a sense of security and safety in the world. He carried this personal relationship with Christ with him when he entered cancer treatment. As a child and as a teen, Robert uh, was very extroverted. And after switching to public school at uh, in grade nine, this continued. He was very socially popular, he was successful in sports, he was gregarious, and he described himself as being invincible. He described himself as being invincible. He was an excellent student. He loved athletics, food, alcohol, smoking pot, dating girls, and he was an admired athlete. His faith was shattered by the sudden appearance of life-threatening leukemia and the eight months of chemotherapy that it demanded. He was forced to give up his athletic scholarship to college that he had won. He became very, very sick, very fast by the cancer and by the treatment that he had to undergo for it. He couldn't feed or bathe or toilet himself. He was constantly nauseated and miserable and terrified. His mother became his primary caregiver he prayed and prayed to God for healing and for relief from his suffering. 
Robert experienced these prayers as going unanswered. He lost faith in God. He lost faith in Christ. He lost faith in religion. And he lost faith in faith itself. He experienced intense anger with the church, with Christ, and with his parents. He felt that only Western medicine could do anything or had done anything to help him live, to live and to heal him and to relieve his suffering. Chemotherapy and anti-nausea medication, doctors and nurses, he felt, saved his life. When he reached out to Christ for help, he felt that Christ had forsaken him. He lost all spiritual feeling, all feelings of faith, which had been a sustaining part of his life. And this loss was devastating for him. So I have now shared with you how we came to know Robert during his three preparatory sessions. Next, I'm going to share with you the central part of his psilocybin session which we confirmed was the active drug once the study was unblinded. Although it felt very much to us like he was on a psilocybin journey. Of course, ne neither of us knew until the very end of the study when, when um, unblinding occurred. And so what we're talking about is the session that occurred right here after the preparatory sessions and the first of the two dosing sessions. About one hour into the journey, or one hour into after he took his medicine, an entity appeared to Robert. And the entity said, I have come to guide you and show you what the medicine can do for you. The entity told Robert that he was not going to be allowed to see God, but that the entity was bringing information to him from God. The entity would be his side. The entity would be at his side as a guide throughout the entire journey to show him what the medicine can do. So these are our quotes from the very extensive notes that Robert wrote that night. We ask each person uh, at the end of the day to write down as much as they can that night of what happened to them in their journey. And in true obsessional, obsessive <laughs> character style, he wrote pages and pages and pages of what happened to him and much of what I'm what I'm going to report to you comes from that detailed report. Okay. The entity first brought him to his own funeral. Quote, I traveled a very long way to get there. Everything there was dead or, and it had been dead for a long time. I wasn't there in my body. It was just my soul or my spirit or, or something like that. It was like a desert. It was all dry and brown, but it was also kind of like a Salvador Dali painting. So it was very, very realistic, but also very dead. I don't remember having any feelings there, but I knew I just had to keep walking. I had to keep traveling. I had to just keep going through it. It was like I was totally numb. There were skulls all around. I saw skulls everywhere, and they were all black and burnt. I traveled far, so far. It was really far. It took forever to get through that desert. It seemed like it went on forever, but I kept traveling. I kept moving. I knew I had to keep moving. Then suddenly the scene changed. Robert found himself in the large foyer of Grand Central Terminal, Grand Central Station in New York City, where an elegant party was going on. Everyone there was dancing. Everyone was in tuxedos or evening gowns. Robert and his girlfriend were there, and they were dancing together, but they had a hard time staying together. They kept losing track of each other and having to look for each other. And even when they found each other, they ended up losing each other again. His mother and his father were present. They were there at the, uh, the Grand Central party, and they were dancing together. And Robert could see them, and he reported that it was easy for him to keep eye contact with his parents. He couldn't speak with them, but he was able to maintain eye contact with them in a way that didn't happen with his girlfriend. So the Grand Central uh, Station affair went on for quite a while, 
And he described these repeated connections and loss of connections uh, with his girlfriend and with his parents. Then quite suddenly it ended. It ended and he was shot all alone into outer space in a spaceship. When he looked around, he realized he was all alone. He was all alone in outer space. But then he began to feel something happening. He was amazed that he felt his mom and his dad there with him. He felt his brothers, his sister, his grandparents, his college roommates. They were all there, but they weren't in their bodies either. They were spirits that were, were living in the stars, but he felt their love coming to him in the starshine. He said, the stars in the sky were spirits of people who had loved me and cared about me and helped me grow up. I felt their love and the starshine. Every star was someone who had loved me. Then the entity appeared, reappeared, and reminded him again that he was not going to be allowed to meet God. The entity said, though, he had a message from God. The entity had a message from God for Robert. And the message was, the secret of life is be kind to people. That's it. Be kind to people. Be nice to people. After this, Robert returned to Earth. He arrived at a forest and walked through it and climbed a mountain. I couldn't see the mountain, couldn't feel a body, but I felt the mountain. I felt the sense of the mountain, and I felt myself moving for it. I didn't have my body. I just had a mind that was there. I had no body, but I did feel the mountain. The entity said, we have to now go on a journey. And Robert said, I can't keep going on this journey. I don't have a body. I need a body. If I'm going to keep going on this journey, I need a body. And the entity said, well, we'll just have to go shopping for a body. And after that moment, after the entity said that, Robert described, I saw a rack like they have in department stores. And I thought, okay, it's time to shop. It's time for me to shop for a body. So I walked over to the rack and it was obvious to me that there was only one body there. There was just one body on the rack, but, but it was mine. It was mine. The only choice I had was my own body. So I picked it up. I had no choice. I put it on. And then suddenly when I put the body on, everything exploded into light and color and felt an immense sense of joy and relief. Robert told us during his integration session, once I found my body, everything changed. Things exploded in bright colors. Everything started moving much faster. Then my first thought was about my mom and my dad having sex in order to make me. I thought about them. I thought about the sperm and the egg coming together to create me. I thought about them making love, joining together, making me and creating me. Then I saw myself floating inside my mother. I imagined her being pregnant with me and my growing inside her. I thought about her carrying me inside of her and all the nutrition and love that I got from being inside her and warmth from growing inside her. And then I thought about all the food and water and alcohol and drugs that I put into my body through my life. I thought about all the abuse that I put my body through with soccer and weightlifting and staying out late at night. And I thought about all the bad food I'd eaten and all the drugs I'd taken. And then I saw my cancer cells. I saw the cancer cells growing in my bone marrow. And I saw the chemo that I took in my veins that saved my life. I saw all that, but still I had picked my own body. I had picked that body. I didn't have a choice, but it was strange because it felt okay. 
my body felt okay. It was my body. It was my body. It was mine. And it felt okay. And then it was like, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go on. And the entity said, yes, we should go on. So even, even though there was more that followed in Robert's narrative uh, of his medicine session, I'm going to stop here and end the clinical case by describing Robert's uh, what happened after Robert's dosing session and move on to clinically what happened during the couple of months of integration that followed. So here you can see the red line. So we had seven weeks with three integration sessions, a second dosing session, which we felt was placebo, which we agreed, uh, which, which turned out to be correct. And then another four weeks with three integration sessions. So after the dosing session, there were six integration sessions over a period of 11 weeks, and then our work together ended. So during those 11 weeks, we worked with many aspects of Robert's psilocybin experience and his history uh, as they emerged in his journey. Uh, he talked about some of the uh, difficult experiences he had being homeschooled by his mother and his transition to public school. He talked at length about being so sick and how infuriating, and frightening it was to be cared for by his mother, how angry he was at her, and yet how desperately grateful he was for uh, the tender care that she gave and how at no time, in spite of how angry he became, did she ever become cross or angry in any way. Um, we explored these themes and as we did, his body subjectivity came to match what was true on the observable physical plane. He began to feel healthy and he began to experience his body as one that was reliable and strong. He started to explore his relationship with his girlfriend. His haunting preoccupation with body frailty and illness and his preoccupation with death faded. His panic attacks decreased and the intrusive images of his traumatic days as a desperately sick person abated. He started a meditation, he started a meditation practice which had previously been frustrating to him. He tried, but he couldn't access spiritual feelings in meditation. Instead of the Bible, he began studying the Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharata. And as, just as he'd studied the Bible in childhood as a pathway to spiritual connection to God and spiritual feelings in himself, he found that studying these texts rekindled his feeling for the sacred for the mystical, which he was very grateful to have returned to him. He became more aware of his doubts and ambivalence about his girlfriend, and he decided to uh, change therapist and entered um, a more intensive psychoanalytic, psychoanalysis as part of a, being a training case in um, the NYU postdoc psychoanalytic training institution. So I am fond of saying that Robert's chemotherapy was an extraordinarily effective treatment for his cancerous blood cells. And his psilocybin assisted psychotherapy was equally brilliant for the psychological trauma and loss of spiritual aliveness that were the consequences of his illness and its treatment. Although the DSM-5 does not allow a diagnosis of PTSD in reaction to cancer, because it's too common. PTSD can only be diagnosed in extraordinarily uh, uh, threatening situations such as combat or rape. Um, and in, it, it pointedly excludes cancer as a trigger or as something after which PTSD can be diagnosed. But even so, uh, PTSD is a pretty good description of what Robert was suffering from. He had traumatic, intrusive thoughts of the trauma feelings of doom and despair uh, that prevented him from being present in life. He alternated between hyperarousal and hypoarousal and was preoccupied and easily triggered by um, uh, anything that reminded him of his trauma. So how did psychedelic therapy help Robert? 
Robert's journey creatively wove together the most difficult parts of his journey, a shattered relationship with parents, religion, faith, and God, a drastic and permanent loss of his feelings of being invincible, a devastating and long-lasting near-death experience that would not go away even when he became healthy, experiencing himself as a disembodied soul searching for a lost body, the experience of love that came to him literally from the heavens above, spiritual resources of love from individuals in his life coming to him at the moment of greatest aloneness and despair. A rebirth origin story beginning with his parents' union, intruder and fantasies of being carried in his mother's womb, and then incorporating the world, taking in the world, love, food, family, and a deep acceptance of having a vulnerable body, not an invincible body, but even so, a healthy body that had been sick, but was now well. And finally, a spiritual guide, very specific spiritual guide, an entity who was sent by God, but was not God, an entity with one message, be kind to people. So I'd like to emphasize strongly here, and this is very important, and this is probably something that the audience in this particular talk uh, know well, but uh, I felt it was important to say it to a group of psychoanalysts. Uh, it was not the psilocybin molecules alone that brought this transformation for Robert, this transformative process. This was not a purely pharmacologic treatment. This was a genuine combination of a pharmacologic and a psychotherapeutic process that deeply informed one another. It was deeply embedded in Robert's history, his spiritual life, his family history, and his culture and religious history. Plus, Robert brought a very active engagement in the research study itself and a striking read readiness to engage with his therapists and with the, with the uh, uh, process in a very imaginative way. And of course, his experience was shaped in part by the therapeutic approaches of the two therapists that worked with him. A therapist with different uh, clinical orientations might have, you know, he might've had somewhat different experiences and they might've put it together uh, in a different way. I myself am a relational psychoanalyst. And so it is that, <clears throat> that ethos and that way of looking at the world that uh, I brought to Robert, as did my, uh, my co-therapist. So returning to section two, the phenomenology of psychedelic experience in psychedelic assisted therapy. Robert envisioned his life, uh, his birth, his development, and his experiences of taking in love, food, uh, and um, experiences in life. So he had a highly charged life re review where he looked at all the all that he had done and said, have I brought this on? Did I cause this problem? Uh, what do I do now with this vulnerable, flawed body that is no longer invincible? Um, he had a creative reimagination of his origin story, parents, family, the universe facing death. He had aching painful imagery of traveling through life as dead, as lifeless, and as a disembodied wanderer that then was reborn in an embodied way. He had a visitation from a very powerful spirit entity that was uniquely right for him on this journey. His experience was creative in the most literal way. He created his healing journey from both familiar and strange elements aided by the psilocybin and the context and the narratives that the three of us, himself, two therapists, and of course, our culture, the uh, study structure itself, and so many, so many other uh, cultural, social elements that contributed to this process. And he came away being reminded of one of the most universally recognized teachings in spiritual practices around the world throughout time. And that is kindness and compassion for self and others. I'd like to close the talk today 
with a brief return to an academic paper. Uh, this paper is by Peter Gasser, uh, Katharina Kirschner, and Torsten Passy. And if anybody has access to a photograph of Katharina Kirschner, please send it to me. I would love to include her. But on the left, we have uh, Peter Gasser and the right, Torsten Passy. Uh, and in case it's not uh, obvious, this is not a psilocybin assisted study, this is an LSD assisted psychotherapy for anxiety associated with a life-threatening disease. This happened in Switzerland, uh, where um, uh, Peter is a, a practicing psychiatrist and researcher. Uh, we are not there in the US to, to be doing research with, uh, with LSD. Uh, I think that some, some uh, research with LSD is, is coming online, but this is, a, you know, I think over 10 years old, this paper. Uh, no, 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 that's not right. Uh, eight years old, uh, and they they use LSD, and this is a, a nice little spinning image of the LSD molecule, and I've highlighted these two sentences uh, from this paper. The study designs investigated one approach to the dilemma of cancer-related anxiety, a sensible and carefully supervised use of LSD in conjunction with intensive psychotherapy for patients suffering from existential anxiety induced by a life-threatening disease. And I'm gonna to bring to you just a few points from the section titled, Possible Mechanisms of Action at a Psychological Level. Here we go. One, the cognitive experience. Astonishingly lucid thoughts and altered associations. Problems seen from novel perspectives and relationships at many of many levels seen at once. So that's about thinking. Psychodynamic experience characterized by the emergence of material into consciousness that was previously excluded. That is, unconscious uh, feelings, images, memories, and so forth coming forward. <clears throat> and this happening in a symbolic way, uh, a symbolic portrayal of important conflicts, abreaction and catharsis, which means super high emotion around important areas and vivid memories of incidents from the past. All of this coming together in an intense and emotionally affecting psychodynamic experience. And the third mechanism, a psychedelic peak experience with loss of usual sense of self, ego transcendence, transcendence of time and space, a sense of awe and reverence, and meaningful new insights. Now, they put meaningful new insights in uh, number three, but I think that it really actually belonged more in number two. But with respect for the paper, I'm going to leave it in number three because that's where they put it. Okay. So the cognitive experience, the psychodynamic experience, and the psychedelic peak experience, possible mechanisms of action for the improvement in anxiety symptoms in patients with existential distress in an LSD-assisted therapy. So if you're interested in learning more about psychedelic therapy at a training program, a teaching program, uh, Fluence uh, International is a... Um, the, uh, institution that I teach at. You can find lots of courses at fluencetraining.com. If you're interested, um, there's lots more to be learned. I want to thank you so much for your kind attention. If anybody wants to write me, this is my email address, jrgus77 at gmail.com. And with that, I want to thank you for your kind attention and open up uh, our conversation for comments and discussion. Thank you so much for a really engaging and thoughtful talk, Jeffrey. You're and, welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And at this point, I want to encourage all participants to write your questions to the Q&A. There is a space for many more questions there. And I'd like to actually start with a question of my own that came to mind. Uh, which relates to this phenomenon of amplified meaning, which I think is a really interesting feature of psychedelics and the experiences of them. Because like the message that Robert got, that the secret of life is to be kind to people, 
I think that is a profound message, message, but it's also something that you could like easily write on the back of a fortune cookie or a postcard. But it's like really different to really experience that simple message so powerfully. And I'd like to hear if you, if you have any thoughts on this phenomenon of amplified meaning. Wow, <clears throat> that is a really profound question and, and an important one. Um, I'd like to start an answer by saying that I believe that our day-to-day -day ego, our self with a small self, is predominantly devoted to the reduction of overwhelming meaning. That is, if we were truly open to all of the sensations from inside our body and outside of our body, which is, of course, everywhere, we would be utterly overwhelmed. So we learn how to reduce meaning, reduce sensation, and reduce information in order to uh, adapt to the world. We learn what to pay attention to, what to ignore, what's important, what's not important, what's safe and what's unsafe and what's dangerous. And we erect all of these in order to adapt to the world that we grew up in. Psychedelics reduce this very function. This is drug-induced ego dissolution or the reduction of defenses. And so this uh, barrier that we erect in order to be uh, to adapt to living in the real world in very safe circumstances softens and the uh, openness that was there perhaps in utero in the earliest moments of life um, returns. So we're returning to a state of immense and intense openness and less of a need to make meaning in order to, to uh, find safety and security with attachment and with uh, separation. So it is in this state that this tender feeling of increased salience, awe, and being so profoundly affected by things comes forward. So that is my best answer to how increased meaning happens. I also uh, would like, and this is, um, I'm sure that there are neuroscientists among, among our group who could give a better answer than this, but the salience network, which is, you know, along with the default mode network and the task positive network, the salience network is what defines what's important and what's not, what's not salient. And if that goes offline, then everything becomes salient. We don't have the normal distinctions between what's important and what, what isn't important. So there's a more broad spread sense that everything is salient. And since these um, coming offline experiences are not complete, we still have some meaning making capacity. But that's why at the extreme edge, you have things that actually seem banal in day-to-day uh, -day thought, like everything is love. Or worse, everything is everything. <laughs> and somehow the idea that everything is love or everything is everything feels incredibly meaningful in the state in which you are experiencing that deeply as true. But when you return to um, uh, ordinary life, it's so generalized that it doesn't have any distinguishing ability and it seems kind of trite and silly. But this of course is similar to what people will often say when they've completed a 10 year psychoanalysis and they say, well, so what did you learn in your 10 year psychoanalysis? You learn, well, I don't have to worry so much about what other people think. And, you know, my parents tried the best they could, but they're flawed people. And I don't have to be so hard on myself. Well, I mean, you could have you probably knew that at the beginning <laughs> of your analysis, but it's the experience of it in a deeply regressed, emotionally vulnerable space with another human being going there with you that makes those insights transformative instead of informative. And going to an analyst five times a week <clears throat> uh, for an hour is one way to access that depth of um, emotional vulnerability uh, and psychedelics can do it faster <laughs> and more reliably uh, and in the right 
setting can have a lasting impact, in my opinion. Okay, that's the end of my answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I think that's a really good answer. And I think uh, one part or aspect I'd like to underline is like that, uh, like multimodal processing, uh, where like what a person thinks and feels are not like so separated in that state. Right. And the kind of emotions and thoughts are much more connected to each other than they normally are, which can also maybe amplify the meaning. And I think uh, when you refer to that, uh, like, why do we not know uh, those like simple truths, like before undergoing those experiences or psychotherapy? I think that's an interesting question, but uh, I've actually thought or framed psychedelics in some instances as a schooling in the obvious, like the obvious <laughs> that we normally do not notice, but that, which is actually crucially important also. They're, they're crucially important, uh, but to know them is far beyond knowing the words. You know, the yeah. words are, it's like, I don't know. Anyway, I, I, what it makes me think about is uh, Wilfred Bion. And I don't know if many of the um, uh, if, if people in the, in the audience or you are familiar with uh, psychoanalytic, psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion. He speaks about beta elements and alpha elements. And beta elements are pre, there is some extra whistling sound and now it's gone. Um, uh, uh, beta elements are pre-linguistic body sensations, like an infant might experience gas or abdominal distress or hunger or coldness. And those are taken in and metabolized by the mother and responded to, and this process of their being taken in and responded to by the environment is usually accompanied by the mother saying, oh, you were cold and now you're warm, or you were wet and now you're dry, or you were hungry and now you're full. And this process of adding language to uh, a sensation is thought of as the beginning of a thought. And that we have thoughts and therefore we become thinkers rather than we're thinkers that have thoughts. So we are forced to become thinkers because our mothers take care of us and tell us what they're doing. And that's the process of learning how to do it for yourself, learning to recognize that the sensation you have is hunger, is called hunger, and it's helped by eating. You know, a baby, an infant doesn't know that, but an infant learns that. And that's how it learns to think and not be simply as somatically uh, a, a soma that's experiencing, but is also a soma that is experiencing and learning language to uh, expand self-knowledge and self-care. So learning how to take care of yourself is the beginning of separation from the other, from the mother. So this process of learning how to live without the mother is how alienation and separateness and autonomy happen. And that's certainly an important developmental process, but then we can move forward to regaining connection to the eternal, to uh, all that is, whatever, you know, language you want to use for reconnecting with that vastness that we knew intrinsically and intuitively as infants. So that's what I think. And a lot of other, <laughs> that's not my idea, but um, I think that in, uh, there's a lot of psychoanalytic writing about this process of how we use our body to come to know what the world, what we mean, what things mean in the world, and <clears throat> then use language and action to learn how to take care of ourselves. Right. Maybe this uh, concept of embodied cognition is something that we can return to, but I want to read a few questions by the participants. That whistling, whistling is back again, by the way. Yeah, it's my computer. I apologize. Oh, but okay. when, I, when I speak, that whistling will continue. Okay. So there are two uh, questions related to the dose, and I want to combine them to uh, one question. So how large was the psilocybin dose in that study generally and individual case of Robert? And how much was the dose when compared to uh, fresh magic mushrooms? Okay. Um, <clears throat> in that study, we did dosing on a milligram per kilogram basis. We used 0.35 uh, 
um, milligrams per kilogram. So uh, the average person, I think, re received between 25 and 30 uh, milligrams of, you know, uh, high-grade synthetic psilocybin. Although I do want to say that the psilocybin was made by a very devoted um, psychonaut who prayed, lived by the machines, and uh, took as much care in the process as a shaman that was collecting materials for ayahuasca. So although uh, it began with chemicals bought at a, from a <laughs> chemical supply house and um, uh, never knew of a mushroom. Uh, if we are really, truly um, non-dual, we can imagine that this has a spiritual life, that this medicine had a spiritual life. But anyway, getting back to your question, after this study, um, clinical research has moved away from a milligram per kilogram dosing and uses a uh, standard dosing for adults uh, anywhere from um, 10 milligrams to I think 30 or 40 milligrams. Um, and everybody gets the same dose. One of the reasons was that people who are very heavy do not have twice the blood volume or twice the brain size as people who are thin. And I worked with somebody in the study who was was very heavy, uh, weighed over 300 pounds, and she received a huge dose, which I don't think was right. I think she was overdosed because of, uh, because of her size. Um, and so milligram per kilogram uh, dosing is no longer, I don't think anybody does that anymore in clinical research. Maybe they do. I mean, I think that most of the studies that I know of uh, dose everybody, give everybody the same give everybody a, a fixed dose, whether it's a small dose like 10 or a, you know, a macro dose like 30 or 35. You know, I don't know the exact um, uh, correlation with dried mushrooms because not all mushrooms have the same amount of psilocybin in them. And also not all parts of the mushroom, it's not equally distributed throughout the mushroom. But uh, trying to put together experience with both, I would say um, it's in the uh, three to four milligram, uh, three to four gram range. What we were trying to do is uh, help people come to the threshold of a mystical experience, but not into a re-traumatizing uh, or sh experience. So we definitely wanted to move into the psychodynamic level of intoxication and into the mystical state. That was that was our goal, our intention. And you know, people varied in how much, how complete of a mystical experience they had, according to the, you know, seven points on the mystical experiences questionnaire. You wanna, if you wanna try to quantify a mystical state, then there's a there, there's a questionnaire for that. And we used it, you know, um, but yeah, does that, does that answer all the, all the parts of the question? Yes, I think you did. Thank you. Okay. Then there's a question, or actually two questions by Hilla. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Could you say again, what was the training website that you mentioned? FluenceTraining.com. Just put Fluence. Psy uh, psychedelics into Google and it'll come up. If you just put fluence alone, you'll get some kind of aeronautics company. But if you put fluence, F L U E N C E, psychedelics, it'll come up. It does not fluency, which is uh, a word in English. Fluence is not a word. So it's a make up word. There it is. Yeah. So it's like influence, confluence, but with nothing beforehand. FluenceTraining.com. Thank you, Yuzo. Yes. And then there's a second question about what are the most important traits of a therapist that gives psychedelic assisted therapy and how could one study or train towards a goal after a master's degree? Well, <clears throat> there are many 
psychedelic therapy training programs available all around the world. And I want to differentiate what we offer at Fluence from many other programs. Uh, at this time in the United States, nobody can do psychedelic therapy outside of a randomized clinical trial. In Oregon, there is a feverish effort towards training psychedelic facilitators, not therapists, to do psychedelic facilitation. So it is not a treatment for a mental disorder or psychological disorder. It is a facilitator of an experience. And there is training available for Oregon uh, residents who want to become psychedelic facilitators. At Fluence, we offer people uh, training in what's called free, P-H-R-I, psychedelic harm reduction integration. So we train people to do preparatory work and integration work. So we support people in deciding whether they want to take a psychedelic, helping them decide where, when, and how, and then helping them integrate afterwards. So at Fluence, we do not teach people to administer psychedelics. Fluence does have a ketamine training program. And since ketamine is legal, that training includes preparation, administering the medication, uh, not from a medical point of view, but being with, being with the person during their ketamine experience and integration afterwards. And there are many ketamine training programs available. And I myself, I mean, I'm not a training program, but I do ketamine psycholytic therapy in my practice. You know, of course, I don't do any psychedelic assisted therapy in my practice because uh, everything I do is legal and above ground. <clears throat> I'm not I'm not an underground practitioner, but I use much of what I learned in randomized clinical trials in the work that I do with ketamine with patients who are in treatment with me. And also there is, there are tra uh, training programs that include travel to Jamaica or um, South America or other, or the Netherlands for direct experiences with psychedelics. And Fluence does not offer that. The only experiential training that we do at Fluence involves mindfulness practice retreats, which is a very powerful altered state of consciousness. And you know, you learn how to be a sitter with someone who is, you know, in a, you know, practicing mindfulness. So then I think that there is a, a great deal of overlap and applicability in that kind of training. But we do not do any medicine training in Fluence. But there's lots of that available. Um, you have to go outside the United States uh, for that. Thank you. Then there are a few more questions. Um, one anon question from an anonymous attendee is, what is specific about psychoanalytic psychedelic therapy compared to psychedelic therapy without the analytical approach? Um, I can't answer specifically as much as, well, this is what I would like to answer that question. Uh, becoming a psychoanalyst is a way of supporting a complex, somewhat mere, myst mysterious and mystical process. Uh, and it's an attitude, it's a way of being, it's a way of opening up uh, the ability to think and feel uh, it's a technique and a theory, a technique for how to do it and a theory for how to understand what you're doing. And I believe that it is very um, useful for psychedelic therapy. But I don't think it's the only therapy that could be avail that could be valuable. Somebody who is trained in gestalt therapy, somebody who's trained in internal family systems therapy can bring that training and that way of being, that way of being present to another person as they move into this very vulnerable, opened, uh, sort of disentangled, you know, whether, whether, whether ego defenses are disentangled. There are many other ways of being uh, that I think can be enormously valuable with, uh, with psychedelics. Also, um, Psychoanalysis is largely a one-on-one -on -one experience and all the randomized clinical trials just about are about one-on-one -on -one therapy, but many forms of psychedelic healing are done in groups. 
you know, the work that I did with ayahuasca in South America was all done in groups and mushrooms too. And so in that way, the group itself is a container and it's a very different kind of holding environment and a different kind of therapeutic process than a one-on-one. Um, so Anon, does that answer your question or do you, <laughs> is there something more you want to ask? Yes, I think that's answered the question really well. Okay. Then there's a question by uh, Matthias. Uh, I'm interested in how the life narrative timeline of the participants in the study developed after the psychedelic sessions. Apparently, this was not worked on beforehand, such as in hopes and wishes, etc. If I understand the question properly, then it's then the, the question then the questioner is mistaken. We worked before the sessions with hopes, fears, dreams, and how life had come to have meaning and come to lose meaning and what the future might hold prior to the dosing session. Then after the dosing session, we tried to connect with what we had learned as therapists about this particular patient. For example, if somebody said, I lost track of my family, we had a big fight and I missed them, and I never got a chance to make art, I really love that. Then we would bring those uh, that, that particular information for that patient up with them and explore with them how to use the journey to uh, guide them in the future about what was important for them to do in the world. It's important to reach out to family members, important to start taking classes, important to take more vacation, important to cook more wholesome food. So uh, learning about what's important and then using what happens in the, in the session to bring that, <clears throat> but that those insights and values uh, into actual uh, um, values-based action, if you want to use an ACT term, you know, values-based values activity. Does that answer the question? Yes, I think it did. And I think it, it okay. was a valuable part of what I saw as like a beautiful approach in how we did the, the studies that you yeah. focused on the wishes and the apprehensions and on right. the timeline of how to approach life after a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. One of the things that people said to us again and again, after we did the, the, the life review, you know, in the second session, they would say, nobody has ever done that before. I have never talked about my life from beginning till now and into the future, ever. And even in a, a psychoanalytic approach, you let the patient kind of like, tell you what they want to tell you. But in this, it's like birth, grade school, <laughs> you know, you go linearly and it stimulates people to talk about things that they wouldn't bring up normally. If you say, well, tell me about yourself. So it forces them to, to think about their birth of the, their siblings, what grade school was like, you know, learning how to, um, uh, um, learn to do things outside the, outside the home, learning how to play sports or how to be a student, that kind of thing. Yeah, that is certainly a powerful thing to ask people to reflect on. And uh, it's amazing to get it in one session, you know? Mm -hmm. The next question is from Bolo, and I want to remind all participants that you can ask your questions also directly, and perhaps Volo would like to ask his question uh, himself. Well, okay, interesting. Thank you for inviting me there to speak, speak over. I hope you can hear me well. Perfectly. Bye. You can probably hear my baby talking in the background and <laughs> kind of in the company of others, but that won't hinder me asking the question. Uh, so I am curious to hear some suggestions where to perhaps begin or deepen one's understanding of psychoanalytic theory and concepts 
in a way that might be helpful to to well to comprehending psychedelic assisted therapy as a potential cure to developmental trauma especially early childhood uh, adversities as psychoanalysis seems to be particularly rich as a theoretical background in de developmental topics that is a great question. Um, if you're interested in an introduction to psychoanalysis, I recommend Freud and Beyond by Stephen Mitchell and Margaret Black, his wife. And in particular, in, in addition to that, uh, the, the book that opened my mind like a, like a psychedelic experience of relational concepts in psychoanalysis by Stephen Mitchell. Um, for a long time, and in the olden days of Freudian psychology, uh, psychoanalysis was largely seen as a one-person intrapsychic event, something that happened inside the uh, patient, and the therapist was a blank screen or a mirror or somehow objective to the patient and to the process. But starting in the 60s and really in the 70s and 80s, we had what's called the relational turn, where we realized that the psychoanalytic situation is a field of two people, each of whom has a consciousness and an unconscious. And not only that, but they are embedded in a community and in a culture and in a world, all of which influence the psychoanalytic process. So the movement from purely inside one person's mind to including the relationship and then the culture and then the world uh, is part of contemporary psychoanalysis. And so uh, often I find in, psycho in psychedelic circles, this very old fashioned uh, idea of what psychoanalysis is. You know, it's as if, you know, somebody said, I know what movies are, uh, only having seen movies that were made up to, you know, 1920. Uh, and yes, that's where they began. <laughs> that's where we should look for the origins of film. But to say we understand film, because we've seen all the films of D.W. Griffiths, and those are the greatest ones, uh, I think is a big problem. And that's true in psychoanalysis, too. So I recommend those books. And with all modesty, uh, I, I published a paper called A Psychoanalytic Perspective on Psychedelic Experience. So I recommend that paper. And I recommend the paper by Larry Fishman that I referenced in, in my talk called Seeing Without the Self. That is a psychoanalyst's uh, description of a psychedelic experience. And I have to say, I've taught that paper four or five times. And every time I teach it, I learn more and I understand uh, more complexity of what, uh, what psychoanalysis and psychedelics have to offer one another. So if that's what your question was, I hope that that gives you plenty of places to get started. Yes, thank you very much for both your talk and this answer. And thank you for the paper you wrote. I already read it and enjoyed it. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Certainly, if you, if you look at that paper and you look at the references, um, there, there's plenty of places to to explore. Also, I'm sure that there are um, analytic institutes that offer um, introductory courses um, in Helsinki and perhaps other parts of, of uh, Finland that you're that you might be in. And I teach Thank a course you. in fluence called psychedelics and psychoanalysis that uh, you're welcome to take. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Paula. Then we have a question uh, from an anonymous attendee again. Mm -hmm. If patients were drugged into a coma before administration of the mushrooms or the psilocybin and taken out of the coma after uh, two or three weeks, would the psychedelic have had any noticeable effects? Or are the positive changes all about the subjective experiences and not the automatic brain rewiring that happens under the effects of psychedelics? I think it's a combination. Uh, I have 
a reservation about this question when it's asked in an either or manner. Uh, do I think that if somebody were put into a coma and given a psychedelic, would they have the exact same outcome as if they were awake? No. Do I think that they would have no effect whatsoever? No. Um, I know that there is an interest in developing um, psychedelic compounds that foster neuroplasticity and uh, other forms of neurogenesis. Uh, and I, I support that. I, I don't, I'm not here to say that you must have the experience or else it's nothing. Uh, I think certainly for certain kinds of neurodegenerative problems like um, uh, Alzheimer's, the idea of a person with Alzheimer's having a psychedelic journey seems kind of terrifying, while at the same time the neurogenesis and synaptogenesis that, that it brings about uh, you know, might be extremely valuable for them. So kind of context based, you know, I'm particularly interested in psychotherapy and spiritual growth and development. And I think that the lived experience is central to that, but the lived experience is very much embedded in the biological transformations that happen at a brain level. And I, I try to work against uh, an either or approach to the question. Yeah, I'd completely agree. I think the neuroplasticity of, is, of course, like very important. Whatever experiences you then have will like then have a deeper effect. But if you don't have that psychedelic experience, you of course then don't have the insights that that experience can afford. So you'd have to like have the insights then from some other context, maybe psychotherapy. But I think that insights gained in psychedelic experiences are are not without value, I'd say, but they're important too. Correct, yeah. One of the um, uh, hidden dangers in the question is that psychedelic drugs are inexpensive to make and inexpensive to give, and psychotherapy is expensive to give. And so I think that there is a movement to do less and less psychotherapy in order for there to be greater access for more people, cheaper. And I don't think that that's uh, better. Uh, I think that there's a value in greater access for more people, uh, but I think we, we have not studied what's the best way to heal people from, uh, we know certain kinds of suffering. We're trying to figure out uh, the most effective way to deliver them to uh, to deliver data to the FDA for rescheduling. And also there's a large movement to reduce, reduce, reduce the amount of expenditure for therapy and just get the drug into the brain and um, that'll do it. I mean, this is really a, a, an issue in PTSD and MDMA, you know. Um, people are fond of saying, well, you know, there's a reason that people who go to raves are cured of their PTSD. But there actually is somebody who's studying that to, to see if people with PTSD uh, are cured of, or are, have their PTSD improved as a result of going to a rave and taking MDMA and dancing to great music and getting sweaty for six or eight hours. Uh, and whether that does improve their PTSD. Mm -hmm. the, the research that I did was very much focused on the relationship with the trauma, relationship with the perpetrator, uh, mm -hmm. acceptance of, uh, uh, you know, uh, moving from dissociation to affect, moving from amnesia to remembering, you know, all of these psychodynamic processes of recovering from PTSD with the aid of the MDMA. And I've seen remarkable improvements, but that doesn't mean that's the only way that that happens. It's just one way that is being studied. And the results are really promising that with the MAPS protocol for the MDMA-assisted therapy of complex PTSD, people get better. Uh, were there other approaches? We'll have to see. Yeah, we actually have another question related to psychedelic-assisted therapy and PTSD by Jukka, and perhaps Jukka would like to read his question himself. 
thank you very much for a very good presentation. I was uh, I'm interested in your experience of psychedelic assisted therapy with PTSD patients with an abusive childhood background, uh, especially well, sorry, with a what kind of background? Abusive childhood backgrounds. Yes. So, what kind of experiences do you find that they have during therapy, if okay. they have a severely disordered or disorganized attachment relationship? Uh, I love that question, but I do not have an answer for you. I'll tell you why. The only uh, experiences I've had with substance-assisted therapy for PTSD are MDMA-assisted therapy. That is not a psychedelic, in my opinion. Uh, I did five patients in the MAPS MDMA PTSD, I mean, the, the MDMA-assisted therapy for complex PTSD, and I saw impressive improvements, and I could, you know, hold forth about how I thought that happened. Uh, I know that there is some psilocybin-assisted therapy for uh, childhood trauma and PTSD happening, uh, and I don't have anything intelligent to say about it, except that uh, we don't have any knowledge, direct knowledge of anything to say about it. But I do know that in the psilocybin work I've done, uh, relationships, attachment to other people, and <clears throat> a uh, blossoming of attachment patterns happen. You know, anxious people uh, who are insecure in their attachment have a very big uh, like emergence of affective, you know, connection and fear and insecurity with the therapist. Uh, more avoidant people go off on their own and are keep to themselves and are they're in that kind of like rigidly self-reliant space of avoidant, um, you know, attachment patterns. So I have seen attachment patterns shift uh, significantly in psilocybin-assisted therapy. That's partly because I'm a relational psychoanalyst. And, you know, I al I'm always <laughs> thinking about uh, attachment patterns for all kinds of problems, not just PTSD. So that's the lens with which I look at most uh, patients that I that I work with, um, I have a fear that PTSD uh, with psilocybin might have more uh, terror experiences with people who are paranoid, uh, who are very very suspicious of malevolent creatures out there coming to attack them. Which, as we know, you know, is, is central for many people with PTSD. Listen that the world is a very dangerous place. And human beings themselves are triggers for trauma. Anybody who's had early persistent childhood abuse trauma or sexual trauma, they often develop this idea that everybody is dangerous. So don't trust anybody. And if this were to be, you know, like expanded, it could be a, a brilliant opportunity for reworking, or it could be a terrifying experience for re-traumatization. So um, it seems riskier than MDMA, which more reliably makes people feel good. Mm -hmm. And even with the MDMA making people feel good, they still have a lot of fear and trauma and uh, rage and hurt that, that happens. But MDMA is, is more of a feel good, <laughs> a reliably feel good experience than psychedelics, which can go in lots of different directions, than uh, psilocybin, which can go in lots of different directions. Sure. The members so, of this audience know. Uh, so do, do I understand you correctly that uh, for a person with severe childhood traumatization, and uh, you, you would say that MDMA-assisted therapy would be safer than LSD or psilocybin? Well, I'm, I'm going to give a cautious answer, which is to say that I have seen in my own life with patients that I work or participants that I work with, I've seen it really help people in a reliable way that they felt they felt they worked well. So I can't say that it's better because I don't know what it would be like with psilocybin. So you're asking me to make a comparison between something I know and something I have no direct experience with. I just have a bunch of, of ideas that I've concocted in my mind <laughs> about it. Whereas I saw it happen. And so I feel more comfortable speaking from a direct experience of what I saw with MDMA. Hmm. 
So that means that the most ser seriously disordered patients are left out of these uh, treatments because of the risk being too great. I don't think so. I see very, very seriously disordered patients um, got into the PTSD study. However, we, I don't think that we have anybody who is working with people who have had uh, a psychotic episode or have a diagnosed psychotic disorder, if that's what you mean by seriously ill. I don't know that there is any work with people with uh, schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder using psychedelics. But I can tell a, a story, if, if you'd like, about this. No, uh, I didn't mean that. I, I meant oh. uh, people with uh, serious childhood traumatization and PTSD. Uh, no, uh, they're included. That, In fact, you have to have really serious childhood traumatization or really serious uh, um, combat trauma or rape or uh, violent attack with, with a lot of PTSD severity in order to get into the MAP study. Hmm. So really, really seriously symptomatic people are in that study. And in fact, mildly symptomatic people are excluded from the study. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I think we have time left for one question or possibly two, but then we will have to start to end our session for today. Um, do you see any challenges in combining different psychotherapeutic approaches in a clinical trial? And were the therapists trained in psychodynamic approach and then learned something about uh, logotherapy, etc.? Or, or did the therapists have different kind of training backgrounds? Mm -hmm. um, well, I consider logotherapy to be uh, within the overall umbrella of the psychoanalytic therapy because logotherapy is about language and meaning and the suffering that comes from loss of meaning and the revision of meaning or changing how symptoms, how life, how existence itself has meaning uh, is central to all psychoanalytic approaches. Uh, so I don't think that there's a, a, a problem with that, such as IFS or internal family systems, um, rapid psychodynamic uh, transference-focused psychotherapy, uh, existential therapy or logotherapy. I think these are all familiar and similar. I do have a problem with cognitive behavioral therapy being combined with psychoanalytic therapy because I think that the, the base, the core tenets of the therapy and the relationship to the patient and the relationship to the symptoms and the psychotherapeutic process are so different from one another. I can't imagine how they could be combined in a way that's um, effective. But you might wanna ask a cognitive behavioral therapist for their opinion about that. I, I am not one. And while I am not um, against that kind of therapy and I've referred patients to it, uh, it's a very different kind of practice. Than, than analytically oriented, meaning-centered therapies. Because cognitive behavioral therapies are, uh, they just focus on different things. I don't wanna say too much about them. Thank you. And then for the last question of uh, today uh, uh, by Hilla, what were the traits of a great therapist on the context of your study? And were there participants in your study who had mainly neutral or even negative reactions to the psychedelics? Well, those are both great questions. Um, and I, I'm going to, I think I'm going to have to, we don't have enough time to even begin talking about the second one because uh, obviously Robert, the patient that I presented, was a um, very well suited towards this kind of work. Uh, with psilocybin assisted therapy and very, um, a very nice kind of connection between his way of looking at the world and, and mine. So we had a, a very nice rapport and a very nice therapeutic um, alliance that developed. Uh, I think um, the traits include uh, calmness, empathy, compassion, 
imagination, humility, uh, love, a loving heart. Um, yeah, I think I would go with those. I I do believe that direct experience with psychedelics is in, in invaluable towards understanding what people are going through without becoming afraid. I think the, one of the most uh, important things a therapist can bring when a patient is terrified is being calm and not being terrified also and not needing to shut it down or make it go away because the therapist is, is uncomfortable with such profound discomfort in the other is a very important trait to have um and it's something that you learn when you do psychoanalytic training because your patients are going to get extremely emotionally uh, uh aroused at various points in, in the treatment and so learning how to be present with that and neither withdraw or retaliate from negative transferences and being present in a compassionate loving way isn't always easy but it is the therapeutic path I believe. Yeah, I think that list of traits is very essential. Very well said. Yeah. And thank you so much for your talk and uh, your very thoughtful answers to all You're our welcome. questions. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It was really a pleasure having thank you. Me. Okay. So we'll close here? Uh, very soon. I have just a few oh. uh, closing words. Okay. Well, uh, before you go, I yep. want to say peace to all. Peace out. Thank you so much for having me and for coming to uh, to hear the talk. I wish I could see all your faces, but I guess our technology is not there yet. Maybe I'll come visit sometime. You're welcome. Okay. So, um, just a moment. So I want to read a few just general things about our uh, association. Uh, there's also the same information in the chat, but just to make sure everyone gets this, I want to also read it out loud. So if you're not a member of Situ, we invite you to consider becoming one. And you can buy a support membership in our web store at holby.com slash shop slash Situ. And if you're working or studying in an academic discipline relevant to psychedelic research and currently carry out or are planning to carry out psychedelic research or wish to actively advance such research, you may apply for a full membership. And you'll find more info and the application form at Psytu uh, participate slash membership or pretty close something like that. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find it. And we also accept donations. More info at uh, Psytu. Uh, dot fi slash lahioita. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter to keep updated about our future events and other activities. And we also have a reading circle that actually will thus discuss um, Jeffrey's paper, A Psychoanalytic Perspective on Psychedelic Experience, and uh, it will be occur on Tuesday uh, at 5.30 p.m. and you're all welcome to join. The link is uh, in the chat. And um, thank you everyone for participating here today and have a good night and see you. Thank you.